Here we go. Welcome to Wabash Center webinars. It's a good day for a provocative conversation. I am Nancy Lynn Westfield, director of the Wabash Center. At the producer's desk is Carly Hollinsby and Paul Myrie is our sound engineer. Today, our topic is strategies for surviving white supremacist colleagues. During the conversation, questions for our guests can be emailed to Paul Myrie. Paul's email address is myhrep at wabash.edu. That's myhrep at wabash.edu. So this conversation is the sixth in a series of seven conversations with Melanie Harris and Jennifer Harvey. Reverend Dr. Melanie Harris is Associate Dean of Diversity and Equity and Inclusion of Adran College in the School of Interdisciplinary Studies as well as Professor of Religion and Ethics at, Christian, at Texas Christian University. Dean Harris is a well-known facilitator of conversations on anti-racism and the healing the wounds of racism. She has been part of the leadership of the Wabash, College, Wabash Center community for many years. Reverend Dr. Jennifer Harvey is Professor of Religion at Drake University, where she is also the facil a faculty director of the Crew Scholars Program. Dr. Harvey's books on racism include Raising White Kids, Bringing Up Children in Racially Unjust America, and Dear White Christians for Those Still Longing for Racial Reconciliation. Dr. Harvey is also a longtime participant and leader with the Wabash Center. Thank you both, both for these uh, continuing conversations. We've gotten a just overwhelming feedback about um, how these conversations have enriched people, have informed people, um, have given people kind of the, um, the bandwidth and, and the hem allowance, the seam allowance um, to do some of this kind of work. So thank you for your frankness. Thank you for your willing to risk these conversations with us. Um, this week we're talking about strategies for surviving white supremacist colleagues. Um, this topic is particularly intriguing, intriguing because it signals that racism is not benign, that racism is not without harm, that racism does affect, do harm, is problematic in major ways to colleagues, um, that racism is detrimental in the workplace, it is detrimental to faculty communities, it is detrimental to the larger society. So we're, we're not gonna rehearse, is racism detrimental, right? So that's, that's not the point of, of this particular conversation, though we talked about that in the past. This time we're talking about for those who racism is detrimental toward, how do you survive that? What does that mean? So I'm gonna start out, Melanie, I'm gonna start uh, with you and then certainly we'll go to Jennifer. What does it mean for a person who is targeted by racism to read their context, right? Because it's not the same everywhere, right? So how important is it to read the context and help us know how do you read a context? Mm, thank you, Dr. Westfield. Thank you for the invitation to be here with you again. I think the reading the context is the first step really. And it's so vital in part because it helps you to get a sense of the layers of racial awareness or racism that are built into the institution. In the United States of America and throughout the world, it is the case that you can kind of guarantee that there'll be some form of institutional racism that's embedded in any institution, but particularly in educational centers, theological education as well as in higher education. And it's a particular flavor of institutional racism in theological education that is often webbed into the teaching and the tradition of Christian theology. And so it's important to recognize that no matter how great your theological training is that if it has not prepared you for the connection between Christian theology and theologies, as well as racism, then you may need to create room to learn. And that learning step really does begin indeed, as you said, with, with mapping or checking out the context, learning out, learning what the context is. 
one way to do this is to start asking questions, you know, usually before you even get to campus. So I'll start kind of at the beginning of a hypothetical career um, in the conversation that one might be having about whether to come to a campus, whether to interview at a campus. You could be thinking about asking questions to different folks, faculty members with whom you might be working, administrators that you may be working with, students and staff people who are around, uh, questions about what is their actual experience and if they're willing to share, have they experienced or seen racism happen on the campus? Another coded way of asking these kinds of questions is what was the re institutional response to the latest uh, case of police violence or student racism um, in the classroom, uh, how might they work through, and you could certainly ask an administrator this, what are the policies in place and how do they actually work through cases of uh, discrimination, racial discrimination? And one can do that in a very, very upfront and honest way, but certainly in a professional way before one even gets to campus. Having a sense of the collective memory that many scholars and often scholars of color have before you get to campus actually can help you navigate the system and discern whether or not that's the context that you'd like to teach in. If you're actually already in an institution and you're in your first three or four years, let's say, and your eyes are just being open to the levels of institutional racism that are present, it's likely that you have in your gut felt overlooked, unappreciated, that you have probably felt a way in which um, there might be a pattern of tokenizing of scholars of color and you yourself may have felt tokenized or trapped. Uh, this is particularly harmful, but it's also important to recognize it in part because a part of the danger of white supremacist context is the silence around it. So that one might assume going through an experience in your teaching, for example, that the students just seem to always not understand what you're saying, or they feel like the assignments are never well explained. Uh, by you, but seemingly always understandable by other colleagues. That if you're a person of color, if you're a scholar of color, that should raise a flag for you um, to ask yourself, what is it that's happening in the classroom? But not to actually problematize the self first, but to problematize the setting in which the classroom is in. If you are a person of color, you might ask yourself and ask, ask yourself about the context, am I teaching in a context that is racist? Am I teaching in a context where the students actually come into the classroom biased? Um, are there any checks and balances for the students to actually um, try to check there or learn about their implicit bias before they actually get here? Those things can happen in, during student orientation, for example. Um, they certainly happen you know, on many campuses during the summer before first year students even arrive. If those kinds of programmings are not in place to try to create a culture of sensitivity and a culture of, of inclusive excellence, culture of diversity and diverse cultures, um, a culture of talking about race, then it's likely that all of that energy will show up in your classroom. And then it becomes important for you to be able to not only to navigate it, but also to manage it. In the case that once even beyond that, we can talk about what do you do when you wake up and you're tenured and you find out that all along you have unknowingly been surviving racism and racist colleagues all this time. Uh, we can certainly talk about that as well. Mm. well before, before we go to Jennifer, I wanted uh, just hanging a little bit longer uh, with Melanie. What about the colleague who is in a particular kind of jeopardy when you're the only person of color on an all white faculty? Thank you, good question. I will give the response that Katie Cannon gave me to that same exact question, get into therapy. Mm -hmm. Say why? Get into get into therapy mm -hmm. because that position. Katie was Katie, Katie meant that she that was not she an euphemism that she That's meant. Right. She meant That's employee right. therapist. Yes, she did on for the long term, right? Not just for the semester, mm -hmm. but for the long term. It is really true that to be in that kind of situation, to be the one and the only, and I have been and am still um, in that situation in the religion department at TCU, it is detrimental to your mental health. 
um, it is detrimental to your professional career and the way that you and you yourself perceive yourself as a scholar. It can be. I won't say it is, but it certainly can be. And without help on thinking through um, the, the realities of what you're moving through, um, the microaggressions that you may be um, it, experiencing without help and gaining a wider perspective of your worth and your value, it is likely that you can end up feeling like the person that they think that you are. And often that's not a person of value, your scholarship is not worthy, et cetera. Um, so that can land one in a deep state of depression, not just about their own body, their own mental health, their own uh, life, but also their scholarship. And that is unfortunate because we need the scholarship that is coming from scholars of color. We need this, particularly those of us who work primarily in the categories of race and class and gender and sexuality and social justice. We need that scholarship now more than ever. So one really does have to take very seriously that first step of getting help. So we mm -hmm. want to acknowledge those contexts where there is one person of color amongst uh, the majority white culture. We want to acknowledge those contexts that are primarily people of color, particularly historically black institutions. Um, but still racism is a part of that context, as well as all those contexts are then on that spectrum of how race politics plays out. Um, so Jen, I'm going to go to you. Tell, help us understand in this question about context, the politics of race, right? So the politics of race is not always about racism, but it probably is. The politics of race is, is not always against people of color, but it probably is. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> this, the, the context and the politics that is played, it's hard, there's politics that's keeping white colleagues um, yeah. pressed up against the wall. So it's hard for white colleagues then to imagine on top of that typical political place called the academy or this particular context, how racism just makes that even worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I also am really appreciative of getting to continue to be part of these conversations, um, Dr. Westfield. I, so the first thing, I, the first way I wanna respond is just to sort of invite a pause because for those of us who, like myself, who are white and just got to listen in to that profound exchange, I mean, that was like um, a million dollar gift. And, and I say that in all seriousness because for those of us who are white and embedded in these institutional contexts that are you know, rampant with all kinds of isms, including white supremacy, um, what we just heard might be a surprise. It might be an awareness, but we're not sure what to do about it. It might be, and, and what I wanna just really say is as I hear that, it reminds me to think if this is happening in my institutional context, this is happening in my context, right? Whether I know it or not, for me, one set of profound questions becomes, you know, as Dr. Harris just laid out some of the institutional levels at which questions need to be asked in order to have you know, sort of a clear-eyed assessment of what's going on to create an environment in which white supremacist harm is being done at all of these different levels. Then for someone like myself who is white, the, the question becomes, okay, if I now know this is going on, or if I've had an awareness, but I wasn't quite fully sure, where, what, what, what meaningful role am I playing in those institutional sort of contexts? Maybe not all of them, but sort of really am I participating to say, Here's, here's a role here for me, right? So I just sort of wanted to sort of begin by acknowledging that. But so then the other piece I wanted to offer and then comes this question about, um, you know, for white folks, the sort of what's going on politically and racially with in the context for those of us that are white, this phrase was coming to my mind as you asked this question um, by Christine Sleater, who's a sociologist and she, she has this phrase called white racial bonding. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, so this is a, alongside not re a replacement for the institutional anti-racist kind of um, strategic thinking and, and, and solidarity that we need to be showing. We are remiss if we think white supremacist colleagues don't also harm us as white folks. Um, and if I, if I think about academic context where, where so many, for so many of us, because the job is so demanding, right? And the liminality is so pervasive all the time, 
that we, many of us tend to make our home in our academic contexts, right? And for those of us who, who bear dominant identities, especially white racial identity, we need to appreciate and understand that white supremacist colleagues in the space we are now, you know, we're going out for drinks, we're hanging out on weekends, we're bring, raising our kids together. The tolerance of racism and white supremacy from colleagues, even if I don't, even if I'm like, well, this is my lane and that's theirs and I don't really like them, but we're gonna all be at the party, right? Um, we are do, engaged in white racial bonding when we do that. And it means white supremacy is becoming constitutive of our relationality in our, in, our, um, in our intellectual communal campus spaces. And over, over time, that deeply damages and harms us as well, right? So it's not only the moral piece around the experience of colleagues of color and certainly students of color, right? But it is also actually, I mean, I deeply believe white supremacy is a death culture. And so it actually deforms and malforms us as well. And so that creates some really difficult, um, really difficult, really difficult um, uh, realities as we start to sort of recognize that, right? Because I have had colleagues in my life, I was talking to one of them today, with whom my relationship is now broken because I, over time, began to say, I'm not going to racially bond with this person just because that's the only way they can participate with me, not gonna do it. And there is some cost there. Now the, the, the dance party on the other side is worth it because I'm like, oh, life, right? But, but, but there, the, we, we, we need to be really clear that niceness and cohesion when white supremacy is in the room means we're building our relationships through that. And so we have to sort of make some decisions about what, what we want that to mean for us because the damage is real to us as well. And there's no, there's no nice way to put it. Um, and that means really, I mean, you end up over time, there are some, some, the politics are you sometimes don't get invited to parties. <laughs> and so we all, some of us end up also realizing needing to, you know, generate different senses of community because the way we've, we're sort of invited into bond in white campuses or theological contexts is often through racial bonding and there's white supremacy all woven throughout it. So the values of white supremacy that demand conformity, each person has to decide as they enter and exit these communities, whether they will conform to these values. You actually get to choose. But what you're pushing us to understand is that choice is yours to make. All choices have consequences, right? That's that's the grown up lesson here, right? They do you actually get to choose whether to conform to white supremacy, to conform to the values of patriarchy, to conform to the values of lifelessness and death mongering, or say no to those, knowing that each of those decisions has a consequence on your scholarship, on your your performance of your career, your vocation, and how you live in that community. Yes. Um, I, I mean, I think that's, that's not something we often reflect upon as a community of scholars. And certainly I've never heard a group of white friends sitting around thinking about that. Jen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it also means to me that some of the, 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 the stakes are different and the um, need for solidarity looks different but some of the very same strategic assessments of context that Dr. Harris was just laying out in terms of one's own well-being over time. Also, if we want, if we decide to release, you know, a full-scale participation in the death culture of white supremacy, we also have to be engaged in, and because it is a very hard journey to walk by oneself, right? That's and the costs are there. Again, for me, the costs are like, you know. The, the dance party on the other side, but but when you're facing the room, right, and faculty senate is meeting, and you're saying the thing, and knowing you're getting the dirty, you know, I, you know, those those experiences are real, and so you also have to, you know, have some support and some work around um, your own, my, you know, your own value, right, and the community that you feel accountable to, and who, to whom you belong. In and your ability to live with integrity, to espouse right. one kind of value, one set of values, but to function and live comfortably um, in values that you say you don't participate in is, is a real kind of difficult 
way to live. Yes. Um, so trying to get that congruency in your own life as a white person who says, I do not want to promulgate white supremacist values, then you got to do that, right? Those things have yes. to align. Yeah. So Melanie, coming back to you, that you started out, I'm going to um, put the word of internalized oppression into our conversation, because that's what you were talking about, that Dr. Cannon in saying to you personally, as well as to all of us in general, all those who were her mentees, right? Get a therapist because uh, sanity gets dicey in these racist institutions, mm -hmm. in this thing called scholarship in general, and then racist institutions in particular. So what's internalized depression and mm. is it real? It's a good question. Uh, it is real. Uh, internalized oppression is real. It's essentially a turn inward and uh, an embodiment of the kind of um, hatred or negativity, devaluing of one's own self, one's own people, and of one's own work or writing and scholarship. So it's essentially a way of um, having experienced so much oppression, having heard so many times that your scholarship is not quite right. It doesn't quite fit. Um, actually believing that the scholarship does not, is not quite right and does not really fit, is not truly academic. Um, and then moving through your life as a scholar with that frame on one's mind. So that can make writing, for example, very difficult because one can come to the keyboard and to the screen ready to say something, but having to process a whole lot of negativity um, about one's own writing and about one's, what one wants to say about one's one own voice uh, before you can actually get anything on the page. Um, it can show up in the teaching world and in the teaching life and that one has such a deep insecurity about oneself as a teacher um, that there creates, that one can create enormous anxiety, um, often overdoing, often overworking to create the perfect classroom space. Um, to have a kind of stoic, almost dominant, like um, create a power um, in the classroom to try to have power over the anxiety, to have, try to have power over the space. And we know that most power dynamics and relationships, hierarchical ways of doing pedagogy are dominant, dom domineering and not effective. Um, when students don't feel like they're seen and they don't feel like they're heard, where there's no relationality in the pedagogy, there's then there's a, um, a deep reduction of, of students' ability to actually come to the table and learn. So internalized oppression can have, uh, it can happen in a number of different ways. Um, oftentimes when we see it, it's um, oftentimes when it's projected onto us, we don't often catch it when it's actually coming out of us. That is to say, um, I know in my own journey, it's been important to be able to name when I have been made to feel worthless, right? Or when my Scott went, and that's been termed as an intellectual problem. Like the questions that I'm asking are not relevant around race, around class, around the lives and religious lives of African-American women. Um, it's often been said to me that, uh, well, not often lately, but it was said to me by both administrators um, and faculty colleagues that eco-womanism had very little relevance um, in the world of higher education, in the world of climate change, in the world that just really what didn't matter. Um, and I think one of the ways in which I began to catch myself was as I was doing the work of eco-womanism, trying to invite other women of color, primarily women of African descent to also do the work of eco-womanism, I found myself critiquing their work on eco-womanism ever so sharply with such um, kind of agony and caught myself recognizing, oh, I'm the critic. Now I'm, I'm the one who's saying that their work has no value and, and that is not right. So taking a moment to step back and that's oftentimes when we can actually see this kind of white supremacist frame within ourselves. And as uh, we've talked about on this call, in the world of the academy, it's very easy to internalize a white supremacist culture because it's very, it's the way that we have been trained oftentimes, it's the culture that we've been brought up in. Uh, we've been taught to be highly um, 
aggressive and um, fighting in the world of theology, fighting for concepts, fighting for ideas, um, almost not just dismissing, but almost destroying and just, you know, deconstructing um, other people's ideas. We've been taught to be violent in order to be good scholars. And that kind of violence is indeed, I think, um, a part of white supremacy. To be deeply competitive, I think, is the other reality, right? Um, that's a trait or a habit um, that comes out of white su supremacist culture. And some of that is inherent in our society, but some of it really uh, does function primarily in guilds of color, where you have scholars of color um, competing with each other to the point of trying to, you know, ruin someone else's career, uh, ruin someone else's name. And so those are examples of internalized oppression when one is basically using the same exact master's tools to destroy anyone else, but particularly people who look just like you. I think of uh, internalized oppression as believing the lie. Mm -hmm. right, what happens when you take take the lie that people of color are inferior, that people of color are less than, that people of color are somehow fodders for assimilation, right? Those are all lies. And you, and you internalize those, come to believe those as the truth. And then probably the worst in that example is then you didn't teach that as the truth. Mm -hmm. You hold, and that's what you're talking about. You hold other people to that standard of mm -hmm. believing a lie. And the, the amount of mental and soulful contortion it takes to believe a lie, it's a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of misplaced hard work to believe a lie and then convince other people of the lie as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Westfeld, because if one finds oneself consistently exhausted and not just COVID exhaustion, right? But just consistently exhausted in their career because one's always having to write another critique or another book review and also get one's work done and also battle through, you know, um, racism and, and microaggressions in the faculty. If one is always embroiled in fighting, then it's time to take a step back and to ask yourself whether or not you've internalized some of these messages and lies, as you said. I had a friend who told me one time, out of, out of great respect and love, please take the sledgehammers out of your hands. Mm. Wow. I, that's what made me step back. That's mm. what made me pause. Because wow. I was always fighting. I was always it's like, oh, I shouldn't have to fight mm. all the time. What would that be like, right? Yeah. But, and that, as you're saying, that's a part of internalized oppression feeling like I must fight all the time. Yeah. Um, so Jen, talk about, because it's a part about voicelessness, right? So part of internalized oppression, part of navigating uh, white supremacist spaces, racist spaces, faculties who are not uh, reflective on the systemic racism that's in their schools will inherently try to silence people. Mm -hmm. That's one of the characteristics. Are, are, who on your faculty has been silenced? We're not talking about quiet people. We're not talking about shy people. We're not talking about introverts. We're not talking about none of that. We talk about people who have been silenced for when they have spoken or the fact that they cannot risk speaking uh, for fear of punishment or it's more than a fear. They, they, they have survived some punishments. People whose scholarship has been erased Right, so helping people see that acts and practices of erasure and silencing are white supremacist moves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think about um, you know ways in which you know in my own journey, it's been very, very important to, and it's still important for me to, you know, there's been a, a profound challenge around the layers of recognition of how, how deep and how encompassing supremacy is throughout the guild. You know, in some ways that's just, you know, been a, a reckoning that is really hard to sort of um, just, you know, sort of even take in. But it's in my own journey, it's been incredibly freeing to be able to name that and acknowledge it because it's made it much more clear to me 
or it's made it more possible for me to get clear about what I need to, um, uh, in terms of sort of being strategic, being careful, being slow, but being relentless around creating spaces where voice can come to, you know, can emerge, right? Where voicing, voicing can emerge, where connection can emerge. And so, you know, there was a time when I was early in my career at my institution where I was just like, oh my gosh, it's just all a mess. And I don't even know, it's huge. And it's, the, it's, it's got all the power and there's no, you know, and, and in some ways it still is that way, right? So many folks, it probably hasn't looked like it's changed at all. Um, but there was a point at which I realized, okay, wait a second. Like I am responsible and accountable to how I'm living and navigating this space, which is different from thinking I'm going to, you know, fix this entire space, right? This is a large institution. It's been here for a hundred years, you know? Um, and so for me, the clarity about how pervasive white supremacy is has, has, has freed me to go, okay, so where do I want to be and with whom right now? And what would it look like to steps in these ways and the 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 way in which doing that seeking that out growing that in our local contexts including our academic contexts can really um with even small numbers create a feedback loop of enabling one's voice to be found and honored then sort of grows the capacity for your voice to feel a little bit stronger right and so I'm not naive about power dynamics. I'm not naive about things like, you know, job security. I'm not, you know, though I'm speaking, I recognize from, you know, having been here long enough that I have a fair amount of that, but I'm really clear that we can do, do more than we think in terms of giving ourselves the nourishment that we need if we decide to go, okay, what piece, where, where do, where could I carve out a space and with whom? And, and it's sort of like gardening, you know, we're talking about gardening. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a gardener and my plant is almost dead behind me, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's about what we do with the soil and what we do, you know, tending to it over and over and then things start to grow. And yeah. so, and I just, I have to share this one um, ex experience I had where on my campus, this was some years ago, it, was, or it might've been pre 2014, even before um, Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson where the silence that uh, members of our campus community who are black and brown would experience the day after a police killing was just like, I, I would walk on campus and I would just feel it, right? Nobody's talking about this. And um, I remember I was at that time, I happened to have gotten somehow magically elected to faculty Senate. I haven't been elected ever since, but, um, and I decided, maybe it was in 2014, actually. Anyway, I was like, you know what? I don't know what's going to be said here, but I decided to, I put on a Black Lives Matter shirt <laughs> the day after this, um, just like atrocity. And because we were having a faculty Senate meeting and I walked in the room in a t-shirt. So that was already kind of like what, and a Black Lives Matter shirt. And before I took my seat, I just walked around the entire perimeter of the faculty Senate <laughs> and I sat down and that was all that was spoken about, but I felt like, oh, I just found my voice. And I noticed that entire day that when I encountered students and colleagues of color on campus, just wearing my shirt, not, I'm not being a white, saying I'm a white savior. I'm not saying that was an act of grandiosity. I'm saying it was a breaking of silence that was, that mattered to how I felt on the campus. And I experienced folks acknowledging that it mattered, even though it didn't even feel safe for my colleagues and students to talk about it. Right. Um, and so like, and that was one of the most, I was terrified when I did that, but it felt in my body so liberating, even though it didn't change faculty senate's agenda that day, mm -hmm. but there was no question, you know? So, I mean, just, we can do things that really make an impact without having all of the decision-making power in our hands, right? And we can also build relationships when we're willing to take some smaller but visible risks that aren't gonna come into being if, if our primary way of trying to engage is saying, how can I help you feel good in this institution? You know, which is not typically what people need or are wanting to hear, right? They wanna, they, in my experience, want to see evidence of some risk-taking solidarity. And then the, then the things can change. But I, I think your story is brilliant because one person shouldn't be, can't be the Calvary, right? One person should, there shouldn't be this dramatic Cecil B. DeMille moment, you know, when somebody rushes in, you know, and racism is wiped out. It, that's just not the nature of real life. So taking these small steps, as you say, making these small gestures, doing, living together as human beings in community with sympathy and compassion for one another 
is what it means to change things, right? <laughs> That's how mm, change happens. Yeah, yeah. But so attending to that, growing that, you know, being attentive, wherever you put your energies, wherever you put your compassion is what gets paid attention to. Yeah. Um, so for, for all folks in power, whether you're a white person with the, the power that is built in and baked into the structures or people of color with power who are helping younger scholars come through, those words, those gestures are not trivial. They might be the place how that might be how this work is done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing that happens, I think often happens, I've seen it happen in other people's lives and communities too, is that for folks who, like if I spend too much of my time still to this day with as long and much journey as I have in these in this work, if I spend all of my time at my own institution with the folks, the most sort of committed to white supremacist frameworks. If I spend all of my time in those spaces, it would not, it does not take me very long to also, for me to also think that my own voice doesn't matter or that I'm wrong or I'm making stuff up or like, but when we get uh, visible in some, in some meaningful ways, we end up with opportunities to spend time in spaces that also grow that, that sort of strengthen our voice and strengthen our clarity about where, you know, where, where the, the, where the supremacy really lies and what really, you know, tr frankly, what, tr what is true and what is not true. Right. And so we have to be really mindful about that because any of us, any of us can come to believe that, you know, we, we become what we spend our time and energy with. Right. We absolutely do. I believe mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, Melanie, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a junior scholar, I'm doing my best, I'm, I'm on a faculty, it doesn't feel right. I'm going back to something you said earlier. I don't have language necessarily around it because I don't want to accuse nobody enough of them, but it doesn't feel right. My intuition, my gut, my gizzard, something doesn't feel right. What do I do? Mm. Good question. Good question. Thank you. Because I know so many of us are there or were there. Mm -hmm. One thing is to begin looking for resources for help, uh, both within the institution, but especially beyond the institution. So gathering a circle of counsel around you, just to kind of get some signposts is, and oftentimes for my, in my experience, it was trying to figure out, am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? Mm -hmm. And am I right? Or is, am I off here? Is it me? Um, because that's right. The trick of white supremacy first, particularly in um, evaluation processes, right? That there's something wrong with you as a teacher, that you're the, you are the color, problem, that you are the problem. Are that's the right. Problem. That's right. So sometimes getting a counsel um, of just thinkers and um, trusted beings around you. So that can be reaching out for mentors. And sometimes in some of our journeys, we've had excellent mentors um, who have committed their own work and scholarship and their presence with us in our lives um, throughout their, for, for our entire careers, right? But sometimes we had, don't have that experience. We actually have met mentors um, kind of along the way, or we have a friend or a colleague who has a mentor who they suggest. I reach out to those people. Um, sometimes that's people you don't know and ask some basic questions that just simply say, I'm a pre-tenure scholar and I'm experiencing some quote unquote difficulties in the classroom and would just like to have a listening ear and space to talk through what I'm going through. In other situations, and that's, so that's kind of the National Guild kind of framing a circle of counsel around you. Institutionally, sometimes what that can look like is reaching out to an associate dean of diversity, equity, and inclusion, for example, or a office of inclusive pedagogy or pedagogy period, and begin to outline, these are some of the you know, racial dynamics that are showing up in my classroom. This is how it's impacting my students, my students of color, and this is how it's impacting me. Uh, oftentimes there are skilled professionals who have specialization in pedagogy to be able to help you articulate, oh yeah, that's racism. And this is how it's showing up in the classroom and to give a sense of, but also um, true advocate see to actually advocate for you as a teacher and as a faculty person in a situation, in a context where you may be the only person. 
If you don't have that kind of awareness, if those positions are not at the institution, if you feel comfortable with the chair or department head, then it would be important to at least uh, begin a record, right? And that can be as simple as an email um, to the chair and saying, dear chair, um, thanks for your support over my uh, for the course of my career. I'd like to have some conversation with you about what I'm seeing in my evaluations. And then simply post or attach a PDF file of a research and a study on how scholars of color are often times statistically, you know, show up um, getting lower teaching evaluations and why that might be, which leads really to implicit bias and kind of institutional um, structures of racism occurring in the, attach that and just simply say, I'd like to have a conversation with you about this um, and allow that conversation to be both uh, an olive branch to let them know, particularly if the chair or the person um, is not a person of color, it's an olive branch to say, I invite you here to get trained very quickly on how to be an ally and how to be an appropriate chair to me as a person of color right now. So read this article and we can start the conversation. But it's also an invitation for you to step back and recognize you're actually, you're not alone. This institution does better with you present and healthy and well and getting tenure than it does in a lawsuit situation or in a situation where you really are not well um, because it makes the institution look really bad if in fact what's consistently reported about the institution is that institutional racism functions very normatively, um, that harassment functions very normatively within particular departments, especially if they're religion departments, right, with this kind of moral expectation um, of being true and loving, et cetera. Um, the institution doesn't like that bad news. So those are some, some kind of our primary steps. The other thing is just to take back, take a look at the arc of your career. Where do you want to be? Um, what opportunities do you have to publish to write your way out of there? To think about a different institution, to think about a different position, to think about a different job, and in some cases to think about a different career. Trust your in intuition. If it doesn't feel right, Stop telling yourself that it is right and just ignore your gut, right? Yes, yeah. And I'll just, you know, personal testimony on that. Um, when one, and, you know, everybody from Oprah to Beyonce to everybody talks about this, but when you don't trust your inner voice, um, oftentimes you'll feel it physically in your body. Um, that is, you find yourself sick all the time or you have trouble breathing or you're not able to work out as long as you used to. Um, that's usually if your own intuition is not heard, usually your body will signal to you something is wrong. You need to place your body in a more comfortable, a habitable, a positive environment. Um, for me, I was coming back to the work of Martin Luther King Jr. and environmental justice and thinking about the sanitation workers in 1968. And he was writing for environmental justice at that point because he was writing about and working for justice in the environmental workplace of so many of those sanitation workers. It wasn't until I took a look again with a different frame on that essay and that, and that season of King's life that I recognized oh, I'm working in a toxic environment. I'm working in a toxic environment. And if I don't take better care of myself, someone will get assassinated and I don't want it to be me. <laughs> so a lot of the work has already been done. A lot of the models of survival, a lot of the strategies of survival have actually already been lived out by scholars. It's just a matter of getting in their circle and getting, getting connected with them to hear some of the survival strategies. And some of them are very basic, you know, like taking yourself and your partner out to date night, taking care of your body and taking care of your health, making sure you get outside, opening your scholarship to new ideas and new concepts, radically taking on this moment of humility and jumping into a whole different conversation than the one you were trained in. And not with the intention of becoming an absolute expert, but with the intention of actually living into a different way, a whole way of being your scholarly self. So those are some of the invitations. Some of them are very practical, um, but some of them will actually save your writing voice. So do, do not accept the invitation to sacrifice your life for the institution that you're working for. Ashe, 
Ah, Shay. Say that again. That's a <laughs> amen corner. <laughs> do, not, do not accept the invitation to sacrifice your life that's for right. the institution that is trying to kill you. That's right. And yeah, call it yeah. scholarship. That's right. right. That is not scholarship. Mm. That's right. And institutions cannot love, as we've said before. Letty Russell said that um, many, many times to many of us. Institutions cannot love. They do not love. They do not know how to love. So in a situation, you know, I happen to be in Fort Worth, Texas, in the middle of a very important winter storm. Um, this is not the moment to look at the institution for a saving grace or a, a handout um, or help. Um, you need to have cultivated relationships in your own neighborhood, in your own area to, to be able to survive a storm. And certainly when we, as um, we move through different moments um, of racial injustice um, in the country and that kind of heightened sensitivity around the insurrection, the impeachment, the movement um, and the death of so many brown and black bodies due to COVID, but so much um, around the racial pandemic um, those are moments to reach out to the communities that are really going to help. And sometimes the institution is not that place. Hmm. Do not think that if you are a good scholar that you will be spared racist acts. They don't yeah. care if you're a good scholar to spare you. It doesn't work like that, right? That's not the nature of racism. Right. Um, all right, Paul, we're coming at you. We're coming in hot. <laughs> <laughs> If you have questions for our panelists, please email Paul Myrie at myhrep at bobash.edu. Paul, are there any questions we can attend to in our remaining time? Here, uh, here's one. Uh, what have you found your white administrators, colleagues, and students most resistant to discussing when it comes to the topic of white supremacy? I think it depends on the context. In the context that I'm in, in the South, in Texas, there was a resistance to the word white supremacy, literally naming it um, and, and actually giving voice to it, um, in part because there was a fear that it was actually already there. Um, I think right now in the moment at the institution where we are, um, the language of white supremacy has been kind of baked in as a second tier to race and reconciliation. And so there's a sense in which uh, the institution would love to be able to spend more time in the language of reconciliation, which may or may not actually be helpful. We have yet to find out at our institution, um, but to recognize the uh, words that, that uh, set people off that is to say, if white supremacy sets people off, that is to say that administrators simply don't even return the email, then you're likely working with administrators or in a context that is not racially conscious and probably doesn't have a whole lot of know-how, how to get racially conscious. Mm. Um, for me, it was a uh, context as well as uh, all the, uh, the lot of consulting that I did um, that people who would call us for uh, consultations would think they had already been personally reflective about their own race and ra racial politics and racist tendencies. So they did not want to enter into personal conversations about how their activities, behaviors, um, because they thought racism was those other people, mm. right? That other dean, that other department chair, right? Not in, not in this tenuring process, even though yes, we turned down all the people of color and tenured the white people, we, we, we won't be held accountable to reflect on those kinds of processes. Mm -hmm. So races, while they could talk about racism, racism was always somebody else's problem over there because see, we're liberal. We, mm -hmm. we have vocabulary, we have understanding. Mm -hmm. Oof, tough going, those are tough conversations, <sighs> tough conversations. I think um, in our context, there's been two. Th one of the mo the hardest things was getting, uh, especially leadership, to think that talking about racism and white supremacy that in their minds that was what sociologists do, and that's what <laughs> ethicists do, and that's what some of the folks over here do, and sort of building a collective understanding that that we've all we we all have to be doing that 
and was that was a huge heavy push and lots of resistance came. I think we've gotten sort of through some of that in the last five years where at Drake University, um, the, the, the edge I see coming now, now <laughs> so watch for it, is as diversity, equity, and inclusion work becomes more, um, more kind of the, the needles moving on institutions recognizing that that's important. Um, I can already feel the pressures around um, that language of diversity, equity, inclusion being um, appropriated to talk about making all voices on campus feel comfortable. And in this political moment, the, the politically conservative students, I can feel it in the that's air. Right. And that's, that's right. gonna be the next is fighting for refusing to concede that the resources of equity and inclusion should be diverted from historically underrepresented groups and marginalized communities who've been experienced injustice, insisting we will not divert those resources to make everyone feel comfortable on campus. That, that's, that's what we're about to find to be really hard. Dr. Harvey, I had that conversation last week. Did you? Oof, I'm, I am not looking forward to that conversation, <laughs> but I know I, I can, I'm, I'm watching the, I'm watching it. It's coming here too. Mm -hmm. Oof. So but that's tantamount to all lives matter, right? That's the that's the all lives matter. Yeah. Uh, uh, or worse. Right? I mean it is that and it's also like and and really that <laughs> like we're post January 6 in this that's moment. It. Like that's so it. actually some things no. <laughs> well, it takes a different kind of academic leadership to be able to say no. Uh, that no. you won't allow for white supremacist rallies on campus, right. um, that white supremacist known speakers are not invited right. into campus. Um, and that takes a different kind of courage as an academic leader, chancellor, president, dean, um, and those decision-making um, positions, those are the who you want to be educated as, as real allies in this work. Yeah. And that, th that those provosts and presidents and deans need to surround themselves with conversation partners and reflection partners that can help them articulate why you will not let the, the local clan leader come on campus. Yep. <laughs> right? That's why, right. Why that is not an issue of freedom of speech, right? right? Why, yes. so, so not only do we, do we need to believe these things, practice these things, but we need to be able to articulate and we need help in, in creating these articulations about why these things need not to be balanced, right? This is not an issue of fairness to make sure all voices are heard equally. That is not what we're talking about. That's not where we are. Yes. And, and the amount of harm that then comes to faculty and to students uh, when they feel betrayed by their own communities um, is rarely healed, right? Mm. You rarely, if, you, if you lose yeah. that, right? That, that kind of harm is rarely, rarely uh, redeemable. Yeah, and oh. I think that's oftentimes where we get caught. A lot of institutions end up, and I'm um, definitely inspired by your work, Jen, on racial reparations, but also, you know, very deeply aware that across the United Nations and certainly here, and there are reparations is a part of the major conversation. Um, reconciliation may not work. It may not right. work for many of our institutions, and that's typically first where we go. Yeah. because that harm is allowed to stay right in place. Um, and what that means is in institutions, you know, it's, it's almost normative for students of color to come in every year to suffer harassment while they're matriculating through the program. They, there are alumni who have stories of harassment. There are, um, you know, graduates from 20 to 30 to 50 years ago who have the same exact stories. Um, yes. That's considered a part of the culture of the institution and sometimes even lift it up as a part of the tradition. With pride, this is our tradition. This is what we do to people. It's like, right. wait, you can wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Ooh. Oh, another question. Some schools are beginning to own or trying to own their histories of racism and white supremacy. What would you say to a school that's trying to do that and how would you help them make their first steps? Yeah, there's some really great models actually. Georgetown comes to mind as one of the uh, kind of premier institutions in higher education at least who's beginning to really take major steps um, around reparations. Um, one of the things I'm impressed with is that they started with a multi-prong approach, right? It wasn't just doing the research um, about 
the slave owners, and, but also the descendants, and also working very, very diligently to create a number of different forums for both faculty and staff, but also students and the entire kind of academy and the entire public to learn about the history. And then also being highly intentional, deeply intentional about creating and reaching out to those who were harmed. Um, so working very hard to put their money where their mouth is to be able to create reparations right there to create scholarships and fellowships and opportunities for descendants of slaves who built Georgetown. Um, Georgetown is not the only model, but that's one that's worth looking at in terms of just the strategy, right, that they use. And then because, of course, it has religious orientation, there is some religious uh, thinking and theology around justice and social justice that's aligned with the work and the shifts that they um, have been doing. I think in a smaller theological school, um, and certainly even in a smaller college, it's important to actually take that, at least that first step, we're all researchers, we're all scholars in a sense to do the work, to do the homework, um, but to align it always with the practical, what are the practical experiences that students are having that um, are basically a kind of um, a remnant of the white supremacist frame and the right supremacist model and the right supremacy baked into the institution. How are students experiencing that legacy of white supremacy now in, at the college and at the universities and what programs are in place to create the kind of counterbalance for the, uh, for the negativity of white supremacy. Mm. Columbia Theological Seminary, uh, just outside of Atlanta. Uh, is also an excellent model. Our colleague Marcia Riggs um, and Dean Love Seacrest um, they've done a marvelous job of not, uh, those individuals as well as the entire school of moving toward an anti-racist model, a model of reparation, a model of um, restoring through scholarships, through buildings, all kinds of major emphases on a model of reconciliation for their seminary mm. and are to be applauded by how they're redirecting um, money, right? In a capitalist system, the question, <laughs> the question so often for anti-racist work is how, is the, how are the funds used? How are the monies used? Yeah. Um, so, so that's at least two examples of schools who, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. What I would say to the uh, person who asked the question is you don't have to sit alone and wonder how do you do this? Look to the models and the people who have already begun to do this work and adapt it to, to your situation rather than think you're starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing to avoid um, as that work is being sought and, and other, you know, and, and definitely echoing look for other models is that one of the traps that easily happens and whiteness does this is think that as our institutions, is there some readiness by some to start to move an institution that the first thing to do is to um, help the white folks do better and think better and learn better. And it is critically important over time, we tell, do tell the stories and learn histories and engage in capacity building with the white folks, but it's urgently important that that's the secondary response. The first is resource redistribution in support of the wellness of those who are being harmed right now in our institution, that's first. And then you, grow, from my perspective, at least part of what we've tried to do here at Drake is grow out from there. Okay, so then to sustain and make that a longitudinal, longitudinal kind of redress, you do have to work with the white folks, but don't don't fall into the trap of starting by, oh, let's use all the resources to get the white folks to be better. That that like that's the you start by centering those who've been who are being harmed as we speak and showing put put your money where your mouth is right there first, and then go from there. And actually, sometimes that also really helps clarify what kind of work you need to do with the rest of the institution. Very quickly, you start to see, oh, that department over there needs some help, right? But you start with those who are being harmed. So there's no, there's no templates for this kind of institutional activity, right? So we need, create, we need creativity, right? We have to imagine institutions moving in these directions because so few have, right? So it's not, it is not something that, that is cookie cutter and you pick from one to, you know, column one, column two. Each institution is gonna have to find their way until it becomes a more normalized thing for uh, institutions as whole communities to grapple with these issues of harm. Yeah. Um, the next and final Dr. Harvey and Dr. Harris webinar in this series will be March 10th. Our topic will be body, flesh, blood, and other tools of racist imagination. 
The Wabash Center website will have uh, this and all of our anti-racist uh, webinars um, in our archive on our website. To our viewers and to our listeners, to consider using these conversations in your faculty meetings and in your classroom settings. They are themselves teaching resources um, for this day and time. Many thanks to my team, Carly and Paul, who make our digital resources possible. Um, to Dr. Harvey and to Dr. Harris, um, again, I think your work is just uh, transformative um, and changing lives all across the country. Um, that people have told us that these conversations are not only new for them, but needed. So anytime the Wabash Center can provide new and needed conversations, uh, we are precisely where we want to be. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And we are out. What an inspirational conversation. Hmm. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.